you know, it takes um, a lot to get a lifelong Yankee fan to come to the to come to the um, the home city of the hated Boston Red Sox. Uh, but here I am, uh, and in fact, somehow the university put me into a hotel room that looks right out at Fenway Park. <laughs> but I was pleased to hear uh, last night at dinner that Dean O'Rourke herself is a Yankee fan. Um, I am here because it is such a great honor for me to be invited by this great law school to address this year's graduating class. Boston University Law School is a very special place. It has a great tradition of openness, as it was one of the first law schools in the country to admit students without regard to race or color or gender. BU Law School also has a great tradition of public service, and you include among your alumni many dedicated and committed individuals who have worked to make this state, this country, indeed this world, a better place. One great example of what happens when you combine the traditions of openness and public service is my friend uh, Hugh Mo. Hugh served as uh, an assistant district attorney in Manhattan and as a deputy police commissioner in the New York City Police Department. He is here today with his family as his daughter Elizabeth is graduating today. And uh, Elizabeth will be following in her father's footsteps as she too will be joining the DA's office. I thought I would first talk about the course I've taken in the law, how I charted my course, what I've been doing, and how I got here. Then I'll conclude by offering a few words of advice for our graduates as they chart their course. How did I get into the law? Almost accidentally, uh, when I was a senior uh, at Princeton, I did not know what to do with myself. I was a psychology major, and I knew that I did not want to go into psychology. And, and so I went to law school principally to defer making uh, a hard decision. There were no lawyers in my family, and I did not know whether I actually wanted to practice law. But once I got to law school, things came uh, together for me. The law appealed to me right away. Um, at the end of my first year, I interned for Judge Henry Worker in the Southern District of New York, and I saw justice in action, justice at work, and I saw the excitement and the drama of the courtroom. I knew then that the law was right for me, and so with one year of law school under my belt, I charted, I charted the course for the rest of my career. Um, I decided that I wanted to come back someday to be a judge. I wanted also to come back after graduating from law school to clerk. And that summer, I had seen these young prosecutors in action. And I knew also that someday I would want to join the U.S. Attorney's Office. And to get there, I realized that I'd have to spend some time first um, at a big firm. And for some reason, I also wanted to have my own law firm. And sure enough, everything fell into place for me. Judge Worker asked me to come back to clerk for him. I spent some time at Davis Polk, and then just as I had planned, I joined the U.S. Attorney's Office. After a few years there, I started my uh, own law firm with two colleagues from the U.S. Attorney's Office. We had a great time, but we didn't make enough money. And so I, I then uh, joined a, a firm that specialized uh, in labor and employment law. And I was following the course that I had charted uh, almost to a T. And in 1994, my dream came true as I was confirmed as a United States District Judge for the Southern District of New York. I've been extremely fortunate for at least two reasons. First, it is very difficult to become a federal judge. And in particular, very few Asian Americans have been appointed to the federal bench. There are now only 14 active Article III Asian American judges in the country, and eight of the 14 were appointed just within the last three years. As for active federal appellate judges, uh, I am the only one in the entire country. Second, I've also been fortunate because I've drawn more than my share of interesting and high-profile cases. Um, as you heard early on, I had the Megan's Law case involving the sex offender registration and notification statute. 
when I held that the law could not be applied retroactively without violating the ex post facto clause of the Constitution, the Daily News put me on its list of junk judges and gave me a nickname, Denny the Pervert's Pal Chin. Um, I also had the Million Youth March case, and the city of New York had denied a parade permit to a group whose leader had made racist statements in the past, and the group sued under the First Amendment. The case was on the front page of the New York Times three times in one week. One of the organizers of the march was quoted as saying, Judge Chin uh, is our brother. That's because I ruled in their favor. Um, on the other hand, a New York Post columnist referred to me as a fuzzy-headed buffoon. Um, some years later, uh, after the Madoff case, the same columnist referred to me as a rock star in a black robe. So you learn to take all of these things with a grain of salt. One of the benefits of the Million Youth March case was how much the public became interested. Friends told me that they were discussing the First Amendment with their teenage children. You could hear people debating the case uh, on the subway. My parents, um, both of whom speak virtually no English, both called me to lobby, saying, you're not going to give them a permit, are you? And when my, uh, when my son, Paul, was in high school, he took a debate class, and the class um, debated two cases. As it turned out, both cases were mine, um, Megan's Law and the Million Youth March. And Paul tried to lay low, but when the teacher learned that his father was the judge on both cases, she made him argue that I was wrong. <laughs> um, at least uh, three of my cases became the plot for Law and Order episodes. The case involving the priest who came forward to disclose the confession made by the real murderer the investment banker who was fired for posing nude in a gay magazine, and the mob infiltrating a Wall Street um, securities firm. And some years ago, in my son's eyes, I really hit the big time. One of my cases was on both ESPN and Saturday Night Live uh, in the same week. Um, this was the penthouse case involving photographs supposedly of Anna Kornikova, the hot tennis star, sunbathing topless on a public beach in Miami. The photographs turned out to be of someone else, and so that person sued. And you know, I had to hold a preliminary injunction hearing and spend a day and a half studying photographs of Anna Kornikova and Penthouse. Several years ago, I had another fun case. Uh, Fox News sued Al Franken to stop him from using its phrase, uh, fair and balanced, in the title of his book. And Fox argued that consumers uh, somehow would be confused into believing that it had sponsored the book. How that could happen, I don't know, for the full title was Lies and the Lying Liars Who Tell Them, A Fair and Balanced Look at the Right. And ironically, uh, when I went through the con confirmation process recently, there was Senator Al Franken, now a member of the Judiciary Committee, asking me questions. I also had a false advertising case involving Listerine and floss. Listerine ran ads claiming that rinsing with its mouthwash was just as effective as flossing in fighting plaque and gingivitis. And disappointing millions of consumers throughout the country, I held that no, it wasn't true, you still had to floss. And some folks started referring to me as um, the Listerine judge. And I didn't like that, the Listerine judge. But you know, it was better than the pervert's pal. <laughs> I also had, um, um, I know there are a lot of uh, IP professors here. I also had the naked cowboy case. Um, the naked cowboy is the street entertainer in uh, Times Square who wears nothing but a cowboy hat, cowboy boots, and white, uh, tidy whiteies white underpants. Uh, tourists will come up and stick dollar bills into his guitar and have uh, their photos taken with him. Well, nearby at the M&M store, the M&M company started running uh, a video that showed the blue M&M dressed uh, like the naked cowboy. And it did so without his permission, so he sued. 
I put color photographs of the naked cowboy and the blue M&M into my opinion, and the first sentence of my opinion read, this is the case of the naked cowboy versus the blue M&M. <laughs> I've had many uh, criminal cases as well, uh, including, of course, uh, the Madoff case. The Madoff case was challenging because I knew the entire world was watching and I did not want the proceedings to turn into a circus. I wanted to make sure that Mr. Madoff, the government, and the victims all had a full and fair opportunity to be heard. I have now been a circuit judge for all of a year. Um, I will miss the trial court, but I look forward to the opportunity to be more reflective, to work on a more collaborative basis with other judges, and perhaps to have a broader impact. One of the things I will miss the most about being a district judge is presiding over the naturalization ceremony by which immigrants become American citizens. I performed that ceremony many times, and each time there were more than 200 immigrants from some 50 countries, and each time I told uh, the new citizens about my grandfather, and I want to tell you about him now because he was very much a part of my course. My grandfather died at the age of 81 when I was still in law school. He was born in China in 1896 and came to the United States in 1916. I believe he came into the country illegally as a paper son because of the Chinese exclusion laws that were on the books then. In the 1930s, my grandfather returned to China briefly and my father was born. My grandfather then came back to New York, leaving his family behind him in China. He could not bring them here to this country because of the laws. My grandfather worked as a waiter for many years in Chinese restaurants in New York City. He lived in one of those railroad apartments uh, in Chinatown, and in each room there would be another Chinese man who was there also uh, without his uh, family. And each month, my grandfather would go to the post office and buy a money order and send it home to his family in China. In 1947, my grandfather became a U.S. citizen in the Southern District of New York, my former court. And I have his naturalization certificate issued on June 9th, 1947, hanging on the wall in my chambers uh, at the courthouse. By becoming um, a citizen, my grandfather was able to bring his family, including me, to this country in 1956. And after we arrived in New York, my parents raised five kids. Uh, as you heard, my, my mother worked as a seamstress in garment factories in Chinatown, and my father was a cook in Chinese restaurants. And in 1967, they became naturalized, and thus I became a, a citizen as well by operation of law. And so each time that I have performed the naturalization ceremony, I tell the new American citizens about my grandfather. I show them my grandfather's naturalization certificate, which I take off the wall, frame and all. And each time I show it to them, I think of my grandfather, of how hard he worked for so many years waiting on tables, of how he became a citizen in 1947, of how he brought my parents into the country, of how they became citizens, and how I, the son of a seamstress and Chinese cook, the grandson of a Chinese waiter, became a federal judge. Now, all of you have someone like my grandfather in your family histories. I know that I would not be here today, that I would not have presided over all of these exciting cases that I've talked about, that I would not now be a judge on the Second Circuit if my grandfather and my parents and others like them had not led the way for me, had they not overcome so many barriers. When I was younger and my grandfather was still alive, I surely did not think of him as a hero. After all, I thought he was just a Chinese waiter. It was only later that I came to appreciate all that he did for me and the rest of my family and it was only later that I came to understand how much a hero he really was as he traveled to a strange country as a young man and worked so hard day in and day out to make a better life for his family. 
Let me conclude by offering a few words of advice for our graduates as you chart your course. First, as you move on, don't forget about your parents and grandparents and others before them and the paths they had to travel for you to get to this point in your lives today. There is much that you can learn from them. Remember also the impact that the law had on their lives, both good and bad, and consider the lessons that we can draw from their experiences. Second, remain balanced and keep a perspective on what's important in life. Some lawyers get so caught up in work they become consumed and ignore their families and communities and even themselves. Some lawyers strive so hard to win they forget their obligations to the court and to the bar. So work hard, but don't overdo it. Be passionate, but don't be overzealous. Don't take shortcuts. You will be a better advocate if you are honest, credible, respected, and well-liked by judges and adversaries and clients. Be a good person and you will be a better lawyer. Third, we should all remember that as judges and professors, as lawyers and graduates about to enter the profession, that we are privileged and fortunate. There are members of our society, however, who are not so fortunate. And there are still so many things in this world that need fixing. Indeed, many members of our communities are not worried about breaking glass ceilings or becoming a judge or making partner or getting tenure. They are worried about much more basic things and we cannot forget them. Finally, I know that for many of you, uh, this is not the best time to be graduating from law school. Like the rest of the country, indeed, like the rest of the world, the legal profession has been going through a difficult time. But we will get through this tough period. Do not let these worries detract from the joy of today's celebration. Be patient, work hard to find something. You will overcome these challenges, just as those who came before us overcame the challenges they faced. So go forth and prosper. And as you chart your course, remember those who came before us those who need our help now and those who will need our help in the future. Thank you very much.